Okay, so let's move on to 4.2, which is critical points, local max, and local minima. Um, so we're going to use something called the first derivative test in 4.2 in order to find out whether something is a local max or a local min. In 4.1, we figured out how to kind of find maxes and mins. Um, but now we're going to use something called the first derivative test to maybe avoid certain scenarios that might trick us just by using 4.1 info. So what is the first derivative test? Let's take a look at these two graphs. When there's a max, the slopes of all these tangents, like we discussed in 4.1, these are all negative. So if I get my ruler, all these tangents are negative before the minimum. And then they become positive. So the tangents go from negative to minimum and then positive. Likewise, when we have a local max, we have positive tangents, we have a zero, and then we have a negative tangent. So why does this matter? This means that just because the tangent is horizontal does not mean we have a max or a min. There's other scenarios that could be at hand that we have to determine whether it is a max or a min. And we use the first derivative test to see the slopes of the tangents on either side of the max and the min. So if the interval is changing from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, then we have a max and a min. Just a horizontal slope is not enough information. So let's take a look at this uh, you know, clear definition of a first derivative test. If f prime at x changes from positive to negative, right here, if it changes from positive to negative, we have a local max at that point C. And this point right here, C, is called a critical point. Okay, a critical point is just anywhere where the first derivative is going to be zero or uh, undefined, and we'll, you'll know what a critical point is for sure after 4.2 and especially going forward. Likewise, if f prime at x changes from negative to positive at the point C, then C is a critical point and we know that there's a local min. But we have to have that change in increasing and decreasing. Okay, so I just put a note here that simply knowing that f at x equals zero does not imply max or min. And on the next example, you're going to see exactly why. Okay, so for this example, we have to find all the critical numbers for y equals blah, blah, blah. Um, then we want to determine which are local min, local max, or neither, um, because neither is a new thing that we're going to be experiencing. So first of all, to find critical numbers, I have to find the first derivative, set it equal to zero, factor, do my thing. So I'm just going to go over here and say y prime is 4x3 minus 24x squared plus 36x. There's my first derivative. I'm going to set it equal to zero, and at the same time, I'm going to factor out a 4x that I see that they have in common here. Okay, I notice a perfect square trinomial here, or, you know, keep factoring until you know otherwise. And I'm fully factored. Okay, really easy. Find first derivative, set it equal to zero, factor to solve, because now I can solve that x is zero and x is three. Okay, so these are my critical numbers right here. These are my critical numbers. But that's not enough to determine whether these are going to be max and min. So watch what I'm going to do in order to figure this out. I don't do decision tables, any of that stuff. I just graph the first derivative, kind of, um, enough to know positive and negative intervals. Because if the first derivative is positive, then I know there's going to be um, a min or a max if it should change it from positive to negative. So if I just go like this, look how crappy this graph is going to be. I know something's happening at zero, something's happening at three. I label it. You know, I like to make labels. Now, this right here. Take a look at this function right here. That is a x to the three function with a zero at zero and three. It's a positive function, so it goes from here, goes through, and bounces off that three. Okay, we should know how to do this from advanced functions. If you don't know this, I mean, you're in trouble. You have to make a decision table and waste a bunch of time. Um, but just a crappy little graph. We don't need to know this area. We just need to know where it's changing from positive to negative. Because where the first derivative, remember, this is f prime at x that I'm graphing. Where the first derivative changes from negative to positive, we're going from negative to positive. Negative to positive is a minimum. I know for sure there's a minimum at zero because of that change from negative to positive. And that's the first derivative test right there. So I can say, therefore, x equals zero is a local min. Okay, if it was going from positive to negative, I know it's a local max. But take a look at what's happening right here. The interval is not changing from positive to negative. It is bouncing off because of this square right here. So from at 3, x equals 3 is neither. And you can think about, you know, like how could the horizontal, how could the tangent be horizontal when, you know, 
this is not a max or a min. Well, the, the graph of the original function f at x actually looks kind of like this. It goes through zero, then turns and goes back up. So this tangent here is horizontal, but you can see that it's not a max or a min, right? It's just turning and going back up, kind of like a cubic function. Okay, so this is one of the tricks that, you know, kind of misguide us when we find the horizontal tangent being zero and it's not a max or a min. So we gotta be aware. We gotta make sure we do the first derivative test and look at this graph. As soon as you see a bounce like that, for sure it's not a max or a min. Okay, and yes, there's gonna be more difficult problems with cusps that we'll see in the next example. Okay, let's take a look at this example. For the function f at x equals x plus two to the two over three, we wanna determine the critical number. So, I mean, we're gonna do the same thing we always do. We always have to find the first derivative, so let's do that. Sometimes it's a little more difficult than others, but this is just gonna be two over three times x plus two to the negative one over three times the derivative inside the function, which is one, so I'm good. Okay, so I'm gonna re reorganize this. Okay, I don't like negative exponents when I'm actually analyzing. I like it when I'm doing algebra. So this is just gonna be a two over three x plus two to the one over three, sorry. That's an ugly three, but you get the point. Okay, so this tells me that I have a critical point at x equals negative two. Now, why? Sir, it's undefined at negative two. Yes, it's undefined in the first derivative at negative two, which means it can't exist in the first derivative. But I'm allowed to plug it into here, like f at negative two is just zero. So it does exist in the domain of f at x. So just because it's undefined in the first derivative, I have to check in the original function if it's in its domain. And if it is, then it is a critical point. It does exist in the function. So something's going on here. Something's going on at negative two, whether it's a, a max, a min, or something. Something that I'm interested in, right? When we're doing graphs and we're squiggling our lines, those are the things that we're interested in in, in this chapter. Okay, so I can write down undefined, but exists in f at x domain. Okay, now, when you get a scenario like this, analyze at both on both sides what's happening in the original function at negative 2.01 and negative 1.99 so you know i again i don't make a chart i do a graph and if this is my asymptote at negative 2 i literally plug in a number you know i can plug in 0 i can plug in negative 1 i can plug in something close to negative 2 but the pattern is that it is going up to infinity. And that's the only thing I'm interested in. The numbers are climbing. But if I plug in negative three, negative 2.1, negative 2.01, I'm gonna know that the numbers are actually decreasing, okay? And what this is gonna tell me, this, this right here tells me that there's no tangent at x equals two. And if you wanna see the graph of f at x, kind of looks like this, and this is a cusp, right? So I don't have a tangent there. You, you'd think that like, like a parabola is a horizontal tangent, but there actually isn't because as this approaches negative infinity, this is kind of positive infinity. They don't really reach each other. So there's actually no tangent at, at that point, that negative two, and we call this a cusp. Just kind of like the absolute value function is a little curved. Um, but you have to be careful for this because the information that we're kind of used to finding doesn't really communicate it as well. Um, so we have to do a bit of a, a bit of a discovery. And you know, when you do a bunch of these problems and you see an exponent like that, it should alert you to the existence of a cusp or not. Okay, not too bad of a section. Um, remember, slopes of the tangents here are negative because this is the first derivative. I just want to go through that again. And here they're positive. So if, if the slopes of the tangent are negative here and positive here, they can't be a, a tangent of zero. They should usually approach each other, like approaching zero, not approaching the opposites. And that's it for critical points. It's uh, stuff we've already known. Um, besides graphing the first derivative and seeing where it crosses the x-axis, like that first example, that's going to come clutch in the next few sections.